Hello, students. Welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. Today we are in Chapter 7, looking at market inefficiencies. This is in contrast to our previous chapters. So in Chapters 5 and 6, the market outcome was the good outcome. If the government tried to intervene in that with taxes or price floors or price ceilings, that made things worse and made the outcome inefficient. This is the reverse. So there are some cases, and I'll learn about what those cases are, where the market does not perform efficiently. In those cases, government intervention is justified. So the two kinds of ways that the market can be inefficient is when there are externalities and when there are public goods. So we'll devote a section to each one of them. Externalities can be either positive or negative. And one way to deal with them is the Coase theorem. We'll learn about that later on and we'll see some other solutions as well. Public goods are the other way that the market can be inefficient. And some issues that arise are something called the free rider problem. You guys are probably quite aware of this already if you've ever done a group project. There's always one guy in the group who never does any work, but somehow gets the same credit as the rest of you guys do on the group project. That's the free rider problem. There's also the tragedy of the commons where a common resource can be depleted because no one has the incentive to conserve it. So more about all that stuff later on. Let's get started on externalities. So definition, it can be either a cost or a benefit. It has to affect a third party and has to do so in a way that's outside the market. So I'll give you some examples to clarify what I mean by that. So there must be some good involved that doesn't have a market. The classic example of an externality is pollution. So if a firm decides to pollute, that harm, harms a third party. People are trying to breathe the air, so it affects a third party and there is no market for pollution. That fits our definition very, very cleanly. So pollution is an externality. Now here's something that is not an externality. Let's say consumers change their tastes and they start preferring hamburgers and buying fewer hot dogs. So it's gonna affect profits of hot dog sellers and hamburger sellers. It also affect the makers of hot dog buns. So you might be thinking a third party is being harmed here, the um, hot dog bun sellers. However, this is not an externality. Remember, an externality must involve producing a good for which there is no market. There is a market for hot dogs, a market for hot dog buns, a market for burgers, so there is no missing market problem. There's a market for every good, so this is not an externality. So you gotta look for, does it affect the third party? And is there no market for this effect? That's the key indicator of whether you have an externality or not. Here's another example, traffic. So if you're driving the road, it's really busy. You're adding one more car to the road and the more cars that are on the road, that's gonna create more congestion and slow everyone else down. So your choice to drive is having an effect on the other drivers. It's slowing them down and there's no market for that. You can't just buy an uncongested road. So that's an externality. Does education involve externalities? It does, but not for the reasons that people usually give for it. So when people talk about the importance of education, they often talk about how it's going to make people more productive when they join the workforce. So that's going to help out the economy. 
That effect, however, is not an externality. There already is a market for labor. Remember, our definition has to affect a third party and has to be some missing market problem, like pollution. There's no market for pollution, so that's an externality. There's no market for traffic, that's an externality. But there is a market for labor, so education by boosting productivity, that effect on its own is not an externality. So if you're going to make the case for education having externalities, you would not want to talk about productivity. What you could talk about instead, if we have more informed voters, that can help our democracy make better choices. So that's going to affect third parties. So it's going to affect not just the person who gets the education, but also everyone else in society benefits as well from a stronger democracy. Even the guy who dropped out of high school still benefits from education because other people are educated and making good choices for democracy, and that's helping out the high school dropouts as well. So third parties are affected. Even people who don't get educations still benefit from the education system, and there's no market for that effect. Even Walmart doesn't sell you a better democracy. There are some things that don't exist in the marketplace, even at places that seem to sell everything. So the effect of education on democracy is an externality. Another component of education that creates externalities is socialization. We're not just trying to fill your head with stuff, we're also trying to turn kids into adults. So learn how to deal with other people and navigate your way through the world. So society benefits from having people who are mature adults and they gain that maturity in part through their education. So that creates effects that hit third parties, that help third parties, help the rest of us, and there's no market for those effects. You can't buy maturity at a store. So this last part of the effects of education is one of the reasons for why we treat high school differently from college. So elementary school, high school, middle school, that's all free. College, you typically have to pay for. Why is that? Well, the socialization benefits are smaller in college compared to the lower levels. So by now, you guys have pretty much figured out what it's like to be an adult, whereas back in elementary school, you still had a long ways to go. You're still benefiting from education, of course, but those benefits are smaller if you're already fairly mature. That is, if you're still really just a young kid and don't really know what adult world is like. So I said in the introduction, there are positive externalities and there are also negative externalities. Positive externalities help third parties. That would things like education. So the benefits of education, strengthening our democracy and making kids into adults, those help out society, those help out other people. So those are positive externalities. Negative externalities are harmful to other people. So pollution is a negative externality because that harms us. Some more examples. Let's say the folks in the next dorm or next apartment are having a loud party and it's going on late into the night and that's affecting your ability to sleep. So it's affecting a third party, it's affecting you. So it meets that part of our definition. There's also no market for a quiet night. You can't just buy that at the store. So that fits our definition of an externality. Furthermore, this is a harmful externality. It's, you want to be able to get to sleep and you can't. So that's a negative externality. <coughs> now vaccines are an example of positive externalities. So when you get vaccinated, you're not just helping out yourself you're also helping out other people. If you don't get sick, then you can't get other people sick. So that's how it's benefiting the rest of society. 
So that's beneficial, so that's a positive externality. Now, to be clear, there is a market for vaccines, but there is no market for, for living in a society that's already well vaccinated. So you get a vaccine for yourself, but you can't just go to the store and say, I want to live in a place where 70% of people get their vaccines. You can't buy those benefits. They can buy that vaccine itself. This could be quite relevant with the coronavirus. So it's quite possible that not everyone will want to get vaccinated. Some people distrust vaccines in spite of the science behind them. And it's also quite possible that the vaccine won't be 100% effective. Maybe the vaccine will reduce your likelihood of getting sick by maybe, I don't know, 60%. So it's not making you totally safe, but it still makes you substantially safer than you would have been otherwise. If you're not totally safe, though, it's, it's less than 100% effective, you would really want to live in a society where lots and lots of other people were also vaccinated because that would reduce your risk further if you're not 100% safe. And now we come to a very, 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 very important result. The first fundamental welfare theorem. So it says, if there's a perfectly competitive market for every good, then the market outcome is efficient. We talked about perfect competition back in chapter three. So we'll go into more depth on that later, but the basic was that with perfect competition, firms had no ability to set prices. They had no market power, in other words. They had to take the prevailing market price as given, and they could not change it. Each firm was too small to influence the market price. So if every good has a market that's like that, that's perfectly competitive, then the market outcome is efficient. This is the big justification for free market economics. So. You can actually prove this given some conditions, and you'll do that if you go on to take a much more advanced course. I won't prove it here because we're just principles level. Now, the key for thinking about this theorem is not, we're not trying to say that there actually is a perfectly competitive market for every good. Rather, it's that in order to improve upon the market outcome, in order to justify some intervention in the market, some kind of government policy, what you have to do is show that your policy will either improve upon a lack of competition or address a good that has no market. So if you can't show how your policy fixes a missing market problem or fixes a lack of competition problem, then that government policy doesn't have a lot of justification in economic theory. Now, where do externalities come in? Externalities are goods that have no market. That was part of our definition back over here. Externalities must involve producing a good for which there is no market. Things like pollution. Pollution is a good that harms us, and there's no market for pollution. You can't go to the store and buy clean air. So because pollution is a good that has no market, that's a case where the first fundamental welfare theorem doesn't apply. We're not guaranteed that the market is efficient anymore. And that means that government policies to intervene in the market could be a good idea. And we'll talk about what some of those policies are shortly. Now, to be clear, this is also not saying that you have to have proper competition and you have to have every good have a market to get efficiency. This is just one way out of many that the market could be efficient. In one of my other classes, Econ 445, we go into some other ways that the market could reach an efficient outcome. So the basic you want to take away from this is that to justify a government policy, you have to show how it fixes a lack of competition or show how it fixes a missing market. So pollution is a missing market, so a policy to address pollution could be justified. 
So here's why the market doesn't handle externalities very well on its own, why you need to have intervention by the government in many cases. So let's think about a good that has negative externalities, a good like pollution. Markets tend to provide too many of those goods. They provide a quantity that is inefficiently high. Why is that? Well, in the market outcome, people think about what are my costs and what are my benefits. They don't think about what are the extra costs I am imposing on society with this pollution. So if you're not thinking about those extra costs that are making of pollution on society, then you're effectively underestimating the true costs. So the true costs are the cost to you plus cost to society from pollution. If you only think about cost to you, you're missing the other half of that equation. So if you underestimate the real costs of pollution, then you're going to pollute too much. That's why unregulated markets or markets with no kind of government policy are going to provide too much pollution. By the same kind of reasoning, we can establish that markets will provide too little of goods that have positive externalities. So we said earlier that vaccines and education both have positive externalities. They have additional effects that benefit society. So if you're, if you're thinking about getting a vaccine, what's on your mind are the cost to you and benefits to you. You're not really thinking about how does my getting a vaccine help out the rest of society. So if they do come with some safe and effective coronavirus vaccine, I get it. I'm not just taking care of my own health. I'm also helping out the people around me because if I don't get sick, I don't spread it. So I'm not thinking about those extra benefits to society. So I'm underestimating the true benefits. So if I underestimate the true benefits of getting a vaccine, then people aren't going to get enough vaccines. That's why there probably should be some government programs to encourage people to get more vaccines. Now, a couple of myths to watch out for. Just because a good has negative externalities does not mean we have to get rid of it entirely. Similarly, just because a good has positive externalities does not necessarily mean that it has to be free or that it has to be provided by the government. There is an efficient level of negative externalities and positive externalities, and that's not always zero, and that's not always infinity. We'll see shortly how do you find this efficient amount of externalities.